Dziękuję bardzo. Zapraszam na naszą prezentację, tak jak już zostało wspomniane, o architekturze Avaya Vena, Vena, czyli Virtual Enterprise Network Architecture. Jest to rozwiązanie architektura, jak tytuł wskazuje, nie tylko która jest koncepcją, ale również rzeczywistą implementacją, wdrożeniem w rozwiązaniach Avaya. Kilka słów zanim przejdziemy do szczegółów odnośnie firmy Unima 2000, której, którą tutaj reprezentuję, której tutaj stanowisko jest na targach. Chciałbym kilka słów o tym, co robimy, czym się zajmujemy. Działamy w branży technologii teleinformatycznych, projektując, dostarczając, integrując środowiska teleinformatyczne, a to, co oferujemy, to oprócz tego, o czym mówimy, czyli rozwiązań sieciowych, również rozwiązania call center, rozwiązania unified communications, rozwiązania wideokonferencyjne, a także rozwiązania dla inteligentnego budynku. Od już kilkunastu lat jesteśmy partnerem firmy Avaya i również oferujemy rozwiązania, które, które są w portfolio, portfolio firmy Avaya. Jest to no, całe spektrum rozwiązań dla infrastruktury sieciowej, dla unified communications, dla wideo, jak również zaawansowane rozwiązania kontakt call center. Rozwiązania te nie tylko są przeznaczone dla rynków enterprise'owych, ale również dla małych, średnich przedsiębiorstw czy oddziałów firm. Tutaj na tym slajdzie widzimy cały szereg rozwiązań, przełączników, które, które oferuje Avaya. To, o czym będziemy mówić, to są te największe, może mało widać, ale one nazywają się VSP, w których zaimplementowana jest właśnie ta architektura, o której rozma rozmawiać będziemy, którą w szczegółach przez, przedstawi John. I jeszcze jedna rzecz, na którą chciałbym zwrócić uwagę, to całe spektrum rozwiązań wideokonferencyjnych, które można zobaczyć u nas na stanowisku, na stoisku, które są tam no, odpalone, które można, którymi można e, pobawić się, mówiąc, mówiąc w cudzysłowiach. E, jest to e, szereg rozwiązań mostków konferencyjnych i aplikacji klienckich, nie tylko na komputery, ale również na urządzenia mobilne, czy to z Androidem, czy to z iOS-em. Także zapraszamy na nasze stanowisko. I tylko dwa słowa jeszcze o godzinie 16 wśród tych, którzy zostawią nam wizytówki będzie rozlosowana nagroda, nawet nie jedna. Także zapraszam. A teraz przekazuję e, mikrofon e, architektowi sie, e, sieciowemu Johnemu Hermansenowi, przedstawicielowi, przedstawicielowi firmy Avaya. Thank you. Thank you. Do, do I need this microphone? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. So, um, good afternoon. It's after 12 o'clock, so I think it's okay to say good afternoon. I have already been introduced. Uh, my name is Johnny Hermansen. I'm a systems engineer at Avaya. So, um, I observed that there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, cloud-based networks and networks fabrics. And a look at the agenda for this conference is a clear evidence of that. So, my presentation is about the uh, technology that allows us to build such networks. Um, It is a technology that will indeed change the future on our, how we will build networks in the future. But it's also a change that has already happened. So there are actually a large number of networks already deployed or that has already deployed this technology. And I will show you a couple of examples to prove this. A, a example of, of real customer networks that I have, I have, I have been engaged with uh, and, and um, to really prove that this is not only about what's going to happen in the future, but it's something that has already started. Um, and the technology in question is the IEEE 802.1 AQ. This is a standard that was approved uh, in March last year. So it's a fully ratified standard. And actually it's the only standard that are, where we have, uh, um, that has been deployed in customer networks, that allows us to build cloud-based networks, that allows us to build network fabrics, and that it has been tested in, in, uh, um, and approved. Um, there have been a number of interoperability tests carried out, and there's no other fabric technology out there that can actually um, claim the same. They, they cannot claim there are live deployment, 
they cannot claim that our uh, interoperability test that has been carried out. There are some proprietary uh, technologies out there, but do you really want to get yourself locked into a corner where you're only depending on one vendor to provide you the right solution going forward? And, and, and uh, 802.1 AQ shortest path bridging, I will be using the, the term SPB throughout this presentation just to, uh, to simplify life a bit. So actually SPB started its life as a technology that the, 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 the people that created SPB or actually drove this to, to, to standardization realized that, that Ethernet had reached a limit of majority where it could be taken outside of the enterprise network and also be deployed in service provider networks and carrier networks. So they started a journey that ended up in March last year where this was approved technology. And we are talking to customers that see that this is, wow, what's happening here? Okay, went to sleep a bit. Um, so we're actually talking also to, to service provider that they see that this is a really, really interesting technology for them to deploy in the service provider space. Okay, so I will show you first a couple of, uh, of real life examples. This is the uh, probably largest campus environment in Norway. It's a hospital, uh, it actually covers uh, four large campuses. There are more than 20,000 employees that connect to this network. They were running a fairly standard or, or I say old world type of network until uh, November 2011 when they uh, uh, deployed um, shortest path bridging. And I will tell you as I, throughout the presentation, give you some reason why they, they, they choose to migrate to this solution. Um, the uh, migration um, was carried out uh, one afternoon in November 2011. It took less than one hour to, uh, to um, get SPB up and running on the blue nodes and the red nodes that you see here. And you can see that are really, really core to the network. And not a single packet was dropped during this migration process. It was absolutely flawless, and it integrates nicely with the rest of the network where they're still running OSPF and VLANs and that the, the legacy type of protocols. Uh, a more recent example is a data center that was built in uh, November last year. It's a new data center. As you can see, um, there are four core switches in the data center. There are a number of, of edge devices or, or server edge switches. The SPB um, has been deployed in the core of the network, the four core switches. However, uh, later this year, they will extend SPB to the very edge of, of the server access layer. Uh, so I will, during this presentation, give you a brief overview of, of SPB, how, how the technology um, uh, it works. I will uh, drill down into the details, as, as far into the details as this 45 minute session allows me. However, before doing so, I like to remind you of some of the problems that we are facing with the traditional networks. So um, this is a fairly typical network example. Um, we have a, typically a, a layer three in the core. We have a server access layer. We have a, maybe a distribution layer. And we have the, uh, the client access layer. Uh, my, my claim is that this is, has become too complex. It's very inflexible. And it's also very vulnerable. It's vulnerable to a number of, of problems like, like loops. Um, we, most of us are familiar with loops in the network. They happen due to human errors or faulty devices, and it can take down a, a smaller or larger portion of, of your network. If the um, slide will move here so we can... Uh, my Mac is struggling a bit with the presentation. It's, it's, it's a bit heavy. So as you can see, a loop can take down a, a, a smaller or larger portion of the network. And actually, this happened at the, uh, one of the largest and most modern hospitals in Norway where one faulty device took down the network for 14 hours. One faulty device. But they made some stupid mistakes, but, but still, it, this was one of the most modern hospitals in Europe. And the network was down to f for 14 hours due to one faulty device. Uh, we have been using VLANs for uh, segmentation of the traffic. And the problem with VLANs, they are constrained to a smaller portion of the, of the network. You cannot easily extend it across the, the whole campus. Um, and there are too many touch points. Whenever you want to configure a new VLAN, there are too many touch points. And it, as I said, it's constrained to a smaller portion of the, of the network. And it's not really good for virtualization. The virtualization will be happening on the, on the application side and on the server side. So what happens if you need to tie together uh, some, um, some host or some devices up on the, uh, in the VLAN up on the right corner with some server uh, down in, in the data center? This was, is what happened at the University Hospital in Oslo. They had some very expensive technical equi equipment, medical equipment, 
uh, installed at, at different uh, um, places in the hospital. They had some uh, servers in the data center where it needed uh, uh, for redundancy, for cooling, et cetera, et cetera. And there were no way they could actually, the, the, the medical equipment um, on the different labs needed to be on the same subnet as the server in the core here in the data center. So there were actually no way that they could actually interconnect the application and the uh, server and the, and the equipment. So they had actually to start to pull fiber across the campuses, which doesn't scale, it's very expensive, it's not very redundant, and all sorts of problems. And the same goes if you start to deploy um, virtual servers. Uh, you want to migrate uh, servers in between data centers, but you have to cross a uh, layer three core. How do you do that? It's, it's not very easy. So to summarize, the network has become too complex. Uh, they're not very flexible, so we need something new. So this is where we start. We need something that is easy to configure. We need something that where it's easy to add services, that is really flexible, robust, scalable, and support virtualization to the full. So, um, shortest path bridging, 802.1 AQ, allows us to build cloud networks. Yeah, fine. It allows us to build network fabrics. So if we are more looking to the data center, we talk about network fabrics. So yeah, it allows us to build network fabrics, fine. Personally, I like to think that the technology allows us to build free form networks. Meaning we can build network any way we need to support whatever we need, whatever type of infrastructure we need, or whatever the layout of a fiber is, whatever shape and form the network needs to take, we can, uh, SPV can support this. And it can uh, encompass the data center, it can encompass the campus environment, it can also uh, encompass your, your, your branch offices. There's no limit to the, uh, to the extent that you can scale this network and form this network. And if you need to make any changes, you can do so without interrupting the, uh, the operation of the network. You can add new uh, um, um, nodes, you can add new uh, links without uh, disrupting the traffic in the network. But the beauty of the technology is once you build this infrastructure, whatever form you, you need it to be, you don't any longer have to touch the interior of the network, the devices inside of your, of, of your network. You no longer have to touch them. You can actually lock the door and throw away the key. Any changes uh, to the network happens at the edge. So if you need to new add a new service to support a new um, uh, say application or to have uh, some security zone, you just configure the edge where the devices connect and automatically they will be connected via a virtual network. I'll show you later how it works. And at the next minute or the next hour, you need to create another uh, segment or uh, support a new user group or a new application or, or add a new service to the network. Again, you just configure the edge of the network where you need to attach a service. And they ca it can be any arbitrary point in the network. It takes minutes rather than hours to, 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 to configure this. If this was a fairly, uh, say, an old type of network and you want to create this kind of of segments of virtual networks, it would take uh, days and, and uh, of planning and in careful configuration to, to uh, make it happen. With shortest path bridging, it takes minutes and actually no planning to do this. And you can add new services as, as you like and as you go, and you can create a, um, a virtual network where you can do uh, um, um, migration of your servers in between data centers. There are actually no limit as to how you can scale and how you can build this. And if you need some layer three services, well, you can add the layer three service wherever you like, wherever they suit you best. It, it could be at the edge of the network or it could be in the core of the network. They could be redundant. Actually, no limitation to where you can put your uh, IP services. It's a technology that is highly resilient. So, um, if something bad happened on a node, it, it dies or you take it down for some services, whatever you, uh, of the link break, uh, traffic will actually reroute um, in, a, we claim less than 100 uh, millisecond. Real life example shows us, or experience shows us, we're down to 20 millisecond of, of, of uh, rerouting of traffic in case of a node failure or a link failure, which is, I think, extraordinary. And another beauty of this is the fact that uh, um, multicast is inherent in the technology. So no longer do you have to uh, deploy 
him or other IP multicast protocol to support multicast in your network. The nodes in the middle of the network doesn't have any even to be aware that you're actually configuring multicast. And I will show you an example later on how this is done. Again, you only have to configure the edge of the network where you want the service to be available. So if you add a, a, a multicast source somewhere in your network, you configure that port. If you, have, if you want to, uh, to add some receivers uh, somewhere in your network, you configure those ports to, to enable multicast. And multicast will start to flow as soon as a, 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 a client re, um, a signal that he wants to receive this multicast stream. And, uh, and, and uh, another receiver flags that he wants to receive the multicast stream, the multicast will start to flow on the shortest path from the sender to the receiver. So this was a very quick overview on, on, on the technology and how it works and, and what it can actually do for us. And then I will dive into the details and how it really works. I think it's really, really important to, to, to stress the fact that shortest path bridging 802.1 AQ is Ethernet. It's an evolution of Ethernet. Ethernet has proved itself over 40 years. There's no question, there's no doubt, and I don't think anyone here will doubt that Ethernet will be the technology that we will be using in the unforeseeable future. It's scalable, it's flexible, and, and the number of technology has tried to replace Ethernet through the years, but they have not succeeded. Ethernet has proved itself. And Ethernet is owned by the IEEE, so 802.1 AQ, shortest path reaching, is an evolution of Ethernet. If you look at the history, it's the latest evolution of Ethernet. And there's no question of compatibility here. If you have uh, Ethernet switches from two different vendors, no one will question, will they interoperate? Can I connect them together? If, if um, um, the equipment is, is built based on this standard, there's no question, do they interoperate? Yes, they do. And they also interoperate with other Ethernet uh, uh, standards. And, and, and um, uh, as, an, as an example, uh, actually a really important example is the um, uh, con so, um, connectivity and, and fault management um, standard that was ratified in, in 2007. It, and it's a very important uh, standard that is used in service provider networks and carrier networks, but also can be now deployed in the enterprise space to, to uh, monitor and to check that you have the connectivity and to troubleshoot your network. So diving into the uh, into the, this technology or, uh, or shortest path reaching, there are two components to this, this uh, technology. One is a data plane. The data plane is almost the same as we've been using all the time for Ethernet. However, it, it introduces a hierarchy. So there are two levels of Ethernet. So this diagram shows a fairly uh, simplified um, network where we have the, the, the green nodes are the, um, the, say the old type of, 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 of the Ethernet work. The blue nodes are the nodes that, uh, that encompasses this new shortest path reaching network, this cloud or this fabric or this preform network or whatever we like to call it. So there are some important things to notice here. Um, the nodes in the, the blue nodes, they are um, using Ethernet switching, standard Ethernet switching to forward uh, um, frames. I have, uh, I'm using a, 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 what I would call a, um, A, a configured Ethernet addresses. You can you can um, use the uh, the system addresses uh, in the boxes, but it's strongly advised to use your own uh, MAC addresses. Uh, it makes it more um, uh, easy to administer, e easy for you to see uh, where the traffic flow, how the switches are interconnected. So it's it's uh, it's supported by the standard, and it's it's it allows us to have a, a more complete view of the network and how they're interconnected, and to uh, see how traffic flows in the network. So rather than using this, the, uh, the MAC addresses that are part of the system, uh, it's um, highly advisable to configure your own MAC addresses. Um, so we have uh, four nodes, and we see we have using address uh, AA001, BB001, C, and D. Um, and traffic is actually forwarded in this very standard base from in, in this network. So as a customer frame or a frame from the, say, the legacy network enters this uh, SPB network, uh, we have an ordinary frame with the, uh, with the, the, uh, the source address and the destination MAC address of this node wanting to send a frame to the server at this side. 
So zero zero no sorry zero zero one 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 and zero zero two 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 at the as the destination node. As this frame enters this uh, SPB node at the edge of the network, it will be encapsulated in a new Ethernet frame. And you can see that the Ethernet frame has a um, a new destination address and a new source address. And the source address is this node here where the traffic enters the network, and the destination address is the address where the traffic is exiting the, uh, the, the network. The B here just indicated that this is a backbone MAC address, but it's a, it's a standard MAC address. There are a couple of fields that are of importance and interest. ICID is a uh, service ID. It's a service ID that is global. So meaning that it will, um, or you can uh, view this as a VPN index. Uh, and it will be more clear as we move forward to see the significance of this ICID. We have a B bit, backbone VLAN ID, which is identical to the VLAN ID we have in a normal Ethernet frame. However, it, it identifies the backbone VLAN that this frame will traverse, and it will be more clear as you move forward uh, why we do have this backbone uh, VLANs. So as, it, as, it, as the frame uh, reaches the, uh, the, the egress node at the other end of the um, SPB cloud, the, uh, this part of the frame will be stripped off and we have the, uh, the original frame um, with the ad address to this uh, receiver at the other end. So this is standard Ethernet forwarding. Standard Ethernet forwarding as we have been doing for, for so many years, for 40 years almost. This uh, IC has 24 bits, meaning we can actually define almost 17 million different uh, uh, service IDs or, or virtual networks. The other components that is being added to Ethernet is the control plane. So the control plane is, is ISIS. ISIS is a, is a um, well-known, robust uh, running protocol, heavily used by service providers and, and in very big um, enterprise networks. The nodes in the network will be uh, using ISIS to, to signal uh, uh, various information, to build a topology, a loop-free topology, and um, when the exchange of information is, is done, we will have a, uh, a cloud or a, a network fabric or a freeform network, depending on what you like to or you like to view it. A few details about ISIS and why they choose to use ISIS as a control plane of, of uh, SPB. ISIS has a very interesting uh, um, um, characteristic of, of actually using uh, layer two. Uh, to exchange protocol information. It does not need IP. It does not use IP to exchange um, information. So there's no dependency on IP in this network. The other important thing is that the, it, it uses uh, extensible uh, TLVs to add information to the frame. So uh, uh, whenever you need to, to, to signal some information across some, some new type of information, you can add a TLV. A TLV means a type length variable. So it's a very extensible protocol. You can add new type length variable fields to send across different type of information. Um, and this is not something that, uh, that I, uh, OSPF supports. So uh, when we were moving from uh, um, IPv4 to IPv6, we actually had to create a new uh, version of OSPF. But however, like OSPF, it does exchange hello protocols, and they create adjacency, they exchange uh, a link state information. Uh, so it's very much, operates very much like, uh, like uh, OSPF. One important thing to note is that in the current version of, of the shortest path reaching, the nodes have to be on a point-to-point -point connection. We don't have shared links uh, uh, as of today. So they have to be point-to-point -point connection, or as I've also shown here, it can be link aggregation. If you need more link, more bandwidth in between the nodes, you can ac actually use link aggregation, but it has to be point to point as such. This shows uh, some of the TLVs that have been added to ISIS to support shortest path bridging. These are some of the uh, TLVs. There are some sub TLVs defined up here. And we have also added some TLVs to support multicast information. So I, I won't dive into this, but just to show you that um, the extension of ISIS to support the um, um, SPB. I got stuck. Uh, 
There we are. Okay. So assume you have this uh, this network of um, this cloud or this fabric or this preform network. How do we actually add service to the network? Assuming we have a couple of VLANs um, at uh, two um, location in the network, and we need to tie these together uh, to create a, a, layer, a layer two network or a virtual network or a virtual service network, as we prefer to call it. We tie those VLANs to an ISID. So actually, just one. So just one single command at the, um, each of the nodes, um, where we tie the, the, the VLAN, a specific VLAN, to an ISID. And an ISID could be any number from, from zero to, or one to as closest to 17 million. So just that uh, uh, single command. It doesn't work any longer, I have to use this one, okay. Um, so this information will be, uh, will be um, advertised by ISIS throughout the network. And a, a virtual network will be automatically created to interconnect those two ports or those two VLANs. And this is a, uh, a virtual network that is completely separated from any other virtual networks uh, in this cloud. Uh, there's no leakage of traffic in between unless you want that to happen. So as you can see, just one single command on each of the node and we have created this new virtual uh, uh, network. This is a layer two uh, network. At any point in time, you may want to create another or, or tie another VLAN into this, this uh, virtual network. And maybe at this end, VLAN 20 has already been used for something different. Then, okay, take whatever VLAN you, you want. There's no dependency. So VLANs are locally significant. They're not globally significant. So just by one single command, VLAN 25, IC100, I, create, I connect this VLAN to my virtual network. As simple as that. And I don't think there's any other technology on the market that allows you to do this. Not the legacy one, not Trill, or any proprietary uh, solution out there. There are a few important uh, uh, things to, to notice. Um, there's no MAC learning and flooding in the core. So the MAC addresses are learned by ISIS. So when you configure the MAC address into your node, ISIS is, is used to, to, to advertise that information throughout the network. So every node in the network know the MAC addresses of the other nodes in the network. That is, that's it. Also, uh, um, broadcast has been uh, disabled. So there's no broadcast in this network. So broadcast traffic is actually uh, transported across the network as multicast traffic. Let's see if this works. Um, so this shows the shortest part three from, uh, from one specific node to the other nodes uh, where they have a, 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 um, a common uh, virtual network or service network created. And also important to notice is that multicast uh, traffic or the multicast tree will be a, a, a congruent to the unicast uh, tree, meaning that unicast traffic and multicast traffic would always take the same path through the network, which is really, really important, and not something that, uh, that uh, uh, Trill, for instance, uh, support. Oops. Uh, this is another uh, shortest part three from a different node. As we can see, the traffic between any two nodes that are part of the same virtual service network will always be uh, take, the, take the same path. If I look at this tree and the, the other tree seen from this node perspective, the path between these two nodes will always be the same, both for unicast traffic and multicast traffic. This is to show you how we can actually tie the various, uh, the, um, what's outside of this uh, cloud or this fabric or this freeform network, how we can tie that into these virtual networks that we create. So we've seen that we can create virtual networks just by a, a one single command at the edge of the network. How can we tie the various uh, um, networks you have outside being a VLANs or other type of networks? Um, there are a number of, of, of options. One option is actually to, to say that we map a specific VLAN to a specific virtual network. So we can map uh, VLAN at, uh, 12 to the green uh, uh, virtual network. We can map VLAN number 10 to the yellow. We can map uh, VLAN number 11 to the, the blue one. It's a, what we call the a UNI, um, or switch UNI type, or, or sorry, um, customer VLAN UNI, where we map uh, the customer's 
VLAN or the VLAN outside are to a specific virtual service ID. We can also do more advanced uh, uh, um, mapping where we can map both the VLAN and the port number. So in this case, we see that the, um, the VLAN on um, traffic coming in on VLAN 10 attached to the yellow uh, VLAN. Um, let me use this example. Uh, the green traffic on, on, on port number 12 maps to uh, the green uh, virtual network. However, uh, um, traffic arriving on a different port uh, also maps into the same uh, virtual service network. So we can, we can uh, based on, on the VLAN ID and the port number the traffic arrives on, we can map it to a specific uh, uh, virtual network. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm, 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 there we are, sorry, I, I they, 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 my Mac doesn't play well with me here. This is the example I was referring to. So we see that there are two different VLANs, but they both map to the same virtual service network. So they arrive on two different ports, but they map, and there are two different, two different VLANs, but we can match VLAN and port to a specific virtual service network. So this gives us a greater flexibility on how we want to map traffic into a virtual service network. And the last example uh, is the uh, so-called uh, transparent interface where we can map anything coming in on port, say port two, to this virtual network, and anything coming in on port one to this virtual network. And, and the same at the other end, meaning we do not care what kind of VLAN, uh, or if there's any VLAN tag or, tag, or if it's untagged traffic, we don't care if it's spanning tree protocol or co other control frames, we just uh, garbage in, garbage out. This is really important in the service provider space where they do not want to care about what the customer uh, sends into the network. They just want to, anything from customer B that enters on port number two is mapped to this virtual uh, network. So the example that we've seen so far is, is, is layer two. So we have created a um, virtual network to, to extend the broadcast domain across the cloud or across the fabric. Uh, so how about the uh, IP traffic? Well, we can do the same. We can actually create the virtual router at the edge of the network. And we have a number of VLANs attached to this virtual router. And then as in the same way as we would uh, um, configure and map a, a VLAN to a virtual network, we can map a, a virtual router to a virtual network and create an IPVPN cloud across. So again, ISIS is advertising this information throughout the network. So we have now created a, by using this simple command that these two nodes, we have created an IP VPN network that interconnects these subnets and these subnets. And we do not need um, OSPF or other routing protocol to, to, to exchange routing information. ISIS will, will um, exchange the, um, and update the, the, the uh, routing tables on the VRFs, on the virtual routers. Uh, so with this information at hand, let's uh, take a look back at the, uh, how this actually, um, uh, or see what happens on the node. So we have, a, we have built a, 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 an SVB cloud, fairly simple one here, three nodes. Uh, we have created a, a layer two network, a, a layer two virtual network to interconnect uh, VLAN 10 and VLAN 10 and at both ends. So um, we have also, we may choose to, to uh, uh, configure more than one backbone VLAN. And the reason to configure more than one backbone VLAN is to allow to do traffic sharing. These VLANs are actually just floating around in the, in the backbone, uh, and uh, traffic can be load shared across those two backbone VLAN. And I will show you an example on how it works in a few slides. So if we look at the, uh, the SBB nodes and, uh, and look at the forwarding database, we can see that it's extremely simple. The forwarding database of this node for the SBB network includes just two MAC addresses. And both MAC addresses points to port 430. One is for this node and the other is for this node. That's, that's, that's all. And the same goes for this node in the core of the network. There are only two MAC addresses in this forwarding table, this node and this node. So if there were um, 
100, if this was a huge network with 100 nodes, this one would have a forwarding database of 100, 100 MAC addresses, which is extremely simple, which is also makes it extremely robust. If we look at it from a customer perspective, these nodes at the edge of the network will have to know the MAC addresses outside of, of, of the nodes that are attached to this network. So if we look at the uh, MAC or the forwarding table for, for this node, uh, for the client side, we see that there are two entries. One is the local node and the other is the remote node. And what we can see is that the, the, uh, the uh, remote node points at the far end of the network. It doesn't point to the next top, it points to the far end of the network. So, uh, and it points to the back, uh, it points to the uh, uh, backbone MAC address so the next hop will be this node. So again, a very, very simple um, forwarding database. If we look at the, uh, the example with the, um, uh, an IPVPN network, uh, the same goes, we have the network, we have the two backbone VLANs, and again, the forwarding database for the uh, SPB network is, is again extremely simple, it's the same. This node has two MAC addresses in its forwarding database, one pointing to this node and one pointing to the, uh, this node. And they're both reachable on port 430. That's its complete forwarding database. Also uh, showing that it, it's extremely simple to, to troubleshoot uh, um, this kind of network. If we look at it from the um, service perspective, so we have created this uh, layer three virtual network that interconnects these two virtual routers at the end edge of the network. Again, we see that there are just two entries in the, in the, uh, uh, in the routing table. Uh, one is pointing to the local network, the other one is pointing to the remote network. It's not pointing to the next hop, it's actually pointing to the remote end of the network which is also something very interesting to see. So you can see actually where the traffic is, is uh, the far end of, of, um, of the, um, the connection, where the, the uh, traffic is egressing the, uh, the cloud. So a few words about this, uh, this backbone uh, VLANs. So ISIS, if there are equal cost paths from uh, the source to destination, uh, uh, ISIS will calculate this, the, the path and, 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 and discover if there are equal cost paths between two nodes. It will then start to um, load shed traffic uh, in between, the, if you have configured more than one backbone VLAN uh, in this cloud, and you just configured a backbone VLAN for the cloud, not per node, you just configured it for the cloud. Uh, SPV will automatically start to, to load shed traffic in between these two backbone VLANs. So uh, traffic from, from, one, from one virtual service network will flow across the upper nodes on say backbone VLAN number one, and the uh, uh, traffic uh, for another virtual service network will flow across uh, the lower nodes in backbone VLAN ID two. This, the standard allows us to build 16 different um, backbone VLANs. Our implementation today supports two backbone VLANs, which is sufficient for most networks, but we will extend it to cover uh, eventually 16 uh, backbone VLANs to give a, a very wide spread of traffic across the network. Another important uh, thing to notice is that the um, shortest path bridging also include what we call reverse path forwarding check. This is to handle a, a situation where we have traffic uh, that for some reason may loop in a network. This means that uh, when a node receives a, a packet, it will check, is this uh, packet arriving on the shortest path back to the, to the uh, uh, source? If yes, forward the packet. If it's not arriving on the shortest path back to the source, then it must have arrived on the wrong interface, drop the packet. As simple as that. So there will be no, no looping of traffic inside an SPB cloud. So let's uh, look a bit at the, uh, at the um, multicast and how it works. So the technology as such is using a, a forwarding model where traffic is, is replicated at the nodes when needed. If the traffic is, is destined to different locations, it's replicated on the nodes where it's needed to be replicated. 
uh, and that's inherent to, uh, to the technology as such. This is allows us to very, very simply um, uh, support multicast in a network. Again, we can just configure multicast at the edge of the network. So if we have a multicast sender, uh, we just configure the edge where we are receiving the multicast traffic and we are configuring the um, the edge where we want to, where we have um, receivers of the multicast traffic. So the receiver will send in an IGMT join message to the network and, and, and multicast traffic will start to flow. Now we give you some more details how this works. And you do not have to configure multicast on the, on the in internal nodes of the network. They, they are actually unaware that we are actually forwarding multicast traffic across this, the network. So let's see how this works in, in, in real life. So this is an example where we have, we built a, um, a network. We have created a layer two virtual uh, service network on top of this uh, with the IC of identifier of 21,001. We have attached it to, uh, to VLAN uh, 1001. If the VLAN already existed, this is the only command you actually have to type in. If the VLAN do, does not exist already, you have to create it, which is two lines of, of commands to, to type. So uh, having created this virtual service network, the only thing you actually have to do then is to enable uh, multicast at the edge node, not in the core nodes, only at the edge node where you want to send or receive multicast, you have to enable multicast. And then on the VLAN where you want to send and receive multicast, you enable RGMP snooping. This is the only configuration you have to do to support multicast in a network. So once you connect the multicast node to the network, it will start and start to send stream. The stream will be pruned at this node. So the multicast will not traverse the network at this point. It will be pruned at the edge of the network, not only until you should receive RGMP joins, There we are, okay. Only when you receive IGMP joins at some far end of the network, this will be uh, a signal back to the, um, the, the source node and trap, and it will start to, uh, to uh, um, forward multicast traffic across the network and be received by the, um, the on the ports where, where we have received joined, um, IGMP joined. And this is also something that is, is quite unique and interesting. We can actually uh, use the, um, the management tools to actually trace the multicast stream across the network. So we can see actually from which node to which node to which node the multicast traffic is actually traversing the network, which is quite unique. There are no other uh, 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 technology that actually allows us to get this clear picture of, uh, of uh, the, the multicast flows in the network. Um, and the management actually, so this is to show you that uh, we also support public service in, uh, in, uh, in the network. We map uh, diffs or code point values to uh, PBIT values currently, and there's also work going on to uh, support traffic engineering. A few uh, uh, words about the, the management applications. Um, 802.1 AG allows us to do day um, uh, two ping trace network. Is a, it allows us to do a link uh, trace in the network, and it also allows us to do uh, continuity checking of, of, of the um, the connectivity uh, between nodes. Something is sorry. Okay. Um, just to finish off by showing you what we can deliver today. So uh, these, are the, these are the products that we ship today that supports this technology. Um, this is what customers have installed today um, at the edge of the network for, for the server connectivity, uh, uh, core nodes for the um, data center backbone or the campus backbone. Uh, campus backbone is smaller networks uh, or distribution nodes. Uh, edge node for uh, uh, client uh, connectivity or for more remote branch offices. This is stackable, this is standalone, this is chassis based, chassis based and also uh, stackable for server aggregation.
so the Avaya Fabric Connect is completely based on the uh, on the open standard 802.1 AQ, uh, shortest path bridging, and and we think that this will change the game the, the, the game of data networking. And we're seeing a lot of interest in the market for this technology. As I said, we have a, a large number of customers already uh, that have deployed this technology. The Olympics in Sochi is going to use this technology, so we're building this the network at Sochi uh, using uh, this uh, technology. Interop in uh, in um, in Las Vegas in May will be using uh, the Avaya Vina technology or SB technology to build probably the largest temporary network that exists on this globe. Um, so this is something that will change the future, but it's something that we already have deployed in a, in a large number of customer networks already. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. So thank you very much for the presentation. Yeah.